everybody. Thank you um, for coming. Sorry about that um, disconnect. I'm still not quite sure what's going on, but um, I do want to get started because we have a, a hard stop with our speaker today. Um, we are over the next two weeks starting the second pillar of biblical justice is no one is innocent. And today we are welcoming Jen McCullen, who, McCollum, who is the CEO of Linkage, which is a leadership development firm with a mission to change the face of leadership. Um, and, and Jen is bringing over 20 years experience in the leadership space. Her focus is on inclusive cultures and advancing leaders of, di of diverse backgrounds. And she is going to help us unpack our role in preventing well-being for all and what we can do about that. So, um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jen, but if could, everyone could please keep their mics on mute. Bill will be following the chat. So if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and uh, um, he will follow up at the end when we have time for questions. And, and if we have to let Jen go with her hard stop at 12, the rest of us can keep talking and, and see where we go. So with that, I um, turn it over to you, Jen. Thank you so much for coming and we look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Bill, because Bill's going to help me drive this morning. Um, I do, we do have some content, and we're going to make it really interactive, but I want to take a step back for a moment. Uh, Linkage, where I, uh, I am the CEO, has been doing um, leadership development for 32 years, and more recently, we've been looking at the critical role of inclusion in leadership effectiveness to find out what is the, what's the link between being an inclusive leader and being an effective leader. And what I'm most excited about, about the work we're doing right now is focused on building inclusive leaders and organizations and helping women, minorities, and all forms of underrepresentation rise in leadership roles. And what I got uh, interested in when Lisa talked about the the theme for the day uh, or the week, which is no one is innocent. So what is our part in the problem? Um, and Bill, I'm going to ask you actually to show the first slide now. For me, um, even though I've been in the leadership development world for 20, 25 years, I think my own personal awakening across the last three to four months with uh, really the rise of the Black Lives Matter, or the, the, this current resurgence of Black Lives Matter, really has made such a significant difference for me personally. And I um, actually said to Lisa, she, she reached out to me in June. So the people on the screen on page one, I actually want to introduce you to, um, they're not here with me physically today, but Bev Wright and Eddie Turner are two um, black executives whom I had been working with anyway. And when Black Lives Matter hit, I reached out to them and I said, what can we do to, to foster change, to, to shift and really go from awakening to sustainable change? And talk to me about your stories. I, I actually feel as a woman leader, um, for the last 20 years that I understand what it's like to be a minority in a leadership role. And as they started telling me their stories of the past and even of the present, what I realized is that as a white woman, I had no idea what they had been experiencing. And so this whole, you know, I never would have said that, um, you know, I'm a racist person. I never would have said that I don't support underrepresented populations. It's who I am. It's what I believe. But as I heard their stories, and we actually took their stories to the stage, we, um, we hosted a webinar on Juneteenth, which is I think how Lisa found out about, uh, about me doing this for you today and, and invited me here. We had 3,500 people sign up for the webinar. We had 1,000 people on the phone trying to listen and learn about this idea of race and allyship, of privilege and how to leverage privilege into proactive allyship to support sustainable change. And so when Lisa asked me to do this, <laughs> Lisa, you'll remember, I, my first thought was, you know, I, I hope you know, Lisa, that I am not an expert. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. I am learning alongside everybody else, but I am going through an awakening. And she said, well, that's why we're here. And that's why we're all here. So, um, I invite Bev and Eddie to be with me because it was their stories that helped me awaken to the fact that um, 
I, I myself personally need to change and our organization helps uh, leaders at all levels change and helps organizations change. So more and more we're moving from um, effective leadership to effective allyship and those are, those are different things. Um, so today we're going to talk specifically about allyship and so if you go to the next page this is a very simple framework and we're going to be going through this fairly quickly at, at a high level but I, I hope that through the course of the next 40 to 45 minutes, we'll be engaging in some both reflection as well as we'll do a, a Zoom room, we'll do a breakout room to help um, with all of our collective awakening. And I also want to acknowledge that Bill and I are, are also in another group that we're talking about the role of race and the role of privilege and the role of allyship and what we can do. So the very first part of this framework is around getting educated. And what does that look like very proactively and intentionally? The next piece is around uncovering your bias. And um, we're gonna be doing an exercise to help just try and get in touch with our biases. Um, examining and using your privilege. Up until three months ago, I would have understood the word privilege, but I don't think I would have internalized it. And now I think every day about how can I use my privilege this day, this week, in a different way than I might have thought about it three or four months ago. The fourth is having courageous conversations. And I would say this is a courageous conversation. As I'm looking through the, the pictures, it's a courageous conversation with, with mostly a homogeneous um, you know, set of people. So it's not only starting courageous. I'm here. Okay. What's that? Or I didn't know if someone was trying to get it. So it's having courageous conversations with each other, but then how do you actually have courageous conversations with uh, people who don't look uh, like you or don't have your background? And then finally is practicing compassion. And compassion is uh, compassion with others, but for me, it's actually compassion with ourselves as well. We're all, um, just by nature of the fact that we're all here together, we are all open. And we are all open to an awakening, opening to an evolution, opening to do something more specific and proactive to instill sustainable change. But it's not easy and it takes a lot of hard individual work. And so having compassion with ourselves is important here as well. So we're going to get started now. Let me just pause for a moment and do a quick sound check with Bill. Is everything, can everybody hear okay? Then I can hear you fine. Perfect. So let's move. We'll go to the next slide. The first is getting educated. Um, I think if you look here, and I won't go through all of these things, but when I think about how I have been um, practicing in the world, in, in the world of inclusion, I don't, I know I wasn't proactive enough about my inclusion. What I think I realize now is I was inadvertently exclusive because I wasn't active enough. So most of the time exclusion with well-intentioned people and well-intentioned leaders um, isn't the extreme that we see, um, you know, certainly in, in the violence and in the news and in the, um, you know, certainly some of the things we've been hearing and with our politicians, it's, it's mostly well-intentioned people who just aren't aware. So are we being passive? Are we disengaging or isolating unintentionally or inadvertently um, and the people that you surround yourself with if they all look more or less like me like you like us um, then we are unintentionally disengaging or isolating um, lack of social attention and treatment it's such a gift that black lives matter had this resurgence in such a powerful way because you couldn't ignore it anymore and when i talked to my black friends bev and eddie i said what gives you hope that this won't be just the next iteration of Black Lives Matter. We've been doing some form of this for 600 years. And they themselves said, it feels different now because our white friends, our white people are getting involved. So that social attention is really important. Um, it can be due to oversight or it can be deliberate. And in my case, I think it was oversight. Um, exclusion is is difficult to defend, but inclusion is difficult to execute. Um, and that's kind of the journey that, that I personally am on now with a lot of support. Um, exclusion, because it's so passive, can decrease work commitment. Inclusion increases the work, and inclusion requires a whole 
whole lot more courage. And so for me, my because I don't think I was intentionally exclusive. I think I was just more passive. And now I am much more proactive and intentional about being inclusive. So if you move to the next page, how are we doing that? Or how am I doing that? Um, and one is through building awareness and education. And we're not gonna go through this in depth today. Number one, two, three, you can do all these on your own. I will say in the back of this deck, there's a link to our linkage website that we believe has some of the top 10 resources, uh, their books, their movies, their white papers that you can use to continue to get educated. And I know Bill and I are in a group sharing resources and my sense is you're probably doing that with each other already. Number four is the one, um, I'm, I'm not a very good learner through books and, and articles. I'm a much better learner when I'm engaging people in conversation. And so number four is the one I've really been intentionally trying to bring people in who look different, who have different experiences and engage with them in courageous conversations. But we're not gonna talk about that today. We're gonna move into step two. And this is about bias. So how many, and maybe we do this for, through a hand raise or through the chat function, how many of you are aware of something called the, the IAT? It's Harvard, it's called the Implicit Association Test. I'm just gonna look at the chat and see if we can get a little, it's a, it's a yes or no. No, okay. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. All right, no, 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 perfect. So some yes, some no, mostly, mostly no's. So on the next couple pages, don't turn yet, um, Bill. It's been a Harvard study with millions and millions of people. It's all, it's internet based. And it's a demonstration of um, all different kinds of unconscious bias. It could be race, it could be religion, it could be gender, it can be weight, it can be age. And it's a demonstration of um, how unconscious our bias is. I would highly encourage you, there's a link on the next page to take it. And I did it last week for fun and I'm gonna go deeper in there for a moment. So one is to try and become more aware of the very natural um, biases that we all have and surfacing those to your awareness. Uh, the second is reflecting on what are the messages that you grew up with and how do they, um, you know, how do they gel with your perspective of yourself and our society today? So for me personally, I grew up in Europe on an army base. Um, I had many black friends, um, but our family never talked about race and we weren't active in racial or social justice. So I didn't grow up with a strong perspective one way or another. I just had some black friends. But what I realize now is because I didn't have those conversations, I had to reconcile as an adult how I felt about these things. And so how are we talking to each other? How are we talking to our children um, in a way maybe that I didn't have the chance to do when I was a child? The third is the think about people you associate with. Who do you surround yourself with? And we're actually gonna do that exercise in a moment to get clear on um, what those people look like, what they sound like, what they feel like. And then lastly, and this is obviously the hardest one, is pay close attention to your thinking. Um, and can you have support structures in place to help people see and play back your thinking to you as they, as they hear you and as they see you behave? So we are gonna go quickly through these things because uncovering your own bias is a really critical step to becoming a better ally. So go to the next page, Bill, and we'll do these really quickly. Um, this is me. Uh, it, it takes about five to six minutes to do every one of these tests. You can see the, the website uh, link there. The first one I did last week um, was around race. And so there's pictures of black, there's pictures of white or you know Caucasian, European descent, and you've got words, positive and negative word associations. And you know, it's, it's, it's demonstrating how quickly your mind associates words with pictures. And these pictures happen to be of race. So even though I'm incredibly aware of this, I've been working really hard on it. When I took the, the test, and again, it doesn't mean I'm racist. It means my unconscious bias is that prevalent that I still have a moderate, not strong, but a moderate preference for European Americans compared to African Americans. I would have hoped that mine would be more neutral, but even after all of this work, the bias is there. If you go to the next page, I kept trying to trick the system. So I said, well, now I'm gonna do religion. And it was Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And you can see my strong automatic preference for Christianity compared to Islam. 
And the next page I said, you know, okay, I'm a gender activist. Or no, this next one was on sexuality. So I said, you know, I've got all kinds of gay friends and I, uh, I have clearly, I'm gonna be neutral and I still had this moderate automatic preference. So the demonstration, and again, it's really interesting to do because even when you feel like you're incredibly neutral, uh, when you take these tests, you realize that your bias is so unconscious that it's there and surfacing that and being aware of it becomes really critical. Okay, so that's me. Let's go to the next page. I want to do a quick exercise. You can do this in your head. Ideally, you would do it on a napkin or a piece of paper that you have near to you. And this is about um, whom do you surround yourself with because it's difficult to be an ally when you're mostly surrounded by people who look and act and talk like you. So go to the next page. And I want you to take two or three minutes and, and actually do this. Name the people who are the closest to you in your life. Maybe family members, it may be friends, it may be spiritual um, connections like at the church. Who are your trusted five? What is their gender, race, age, sexual orientation, education? Do they have disabilities, marital status? Just fill it all in and take about two or three minutes. Okay, Lisa's looking at me. So if Lisa, you're done. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try this. Um, in the chat, just type a word or a phrase about what did you notice? You know, what did you notice when you look at your trusted five? <laughs> Thank you, Amy. So college educated, thank you, Jay. I'm gonna assume you're college educated as well. Maybe you met them in college. Similar, they're all like me. Does anyone have a different experience? All white? Yeah. So this is what happens every time. I'm exactly the same, by the way. Two of my trusted five are on the phone, are on this, uh, on this webcast with me. Um, my best friend from Atlanta and, you know, two other women that are really close to me. They're all white. They're all in their 50s. They're all straight. They're all married. They're all brilliant. <laughs> um, just like me. <laughs> uh, tend to be minorities, gay or disabled. That's all. okay. So Rob, I don't know where Rob is. Would you be willing to to talk about, again, I don't know if you're a minority, gay, or disabled, but are they unlike you? You can chat or talk, I can't see you. Bill, do you need to unmute him? Uh, I'm trying. I see, I see Rob, oh, there you are, hi, Rob. Yeah, you're, you're muted, Rob. You wanna try unmuting yourself? We got it. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so, um, well, I worked in uh, with people with disabilities uh, in a hospital in DC for 25 years. Um, so, uh, majority of the staff of the hospital were um, were minorities. Um, majority of the population we served were minorities uh, of one kind or another. Um, so I certainly got the disabilities, I got the minorities and, and, uh, and uh, in DC and just a majority of, of uh, a lot of my friends are, are also LBGTQ. Um, so it just, it just came with the sort of the territory. Um, I, also, I also grew up overseas in mostly countries that practiced Islam, uh, which is a very comfortable and familiar religion with me. Um, so I add that to it as well. 
Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing that, Rob. It's, I mean, what I love about your story is, yes, it happened to be, it sounds like it happened to be through your work and your upbringing, but you were in environments where those things could happen more naturally. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a, either a very lucky thing or you created those circumstances. Um, and most of the rest of us didn't have that experience when I look at everyone's chat anyway. Um, so when I, when I did this, and I've done it twice now over two years, and it came out exactly the same, you know, I, I actually made a commitment um, three months ago to, to, to say, look, when I do this again, six months from now, you know, it doesn't, I'll still have my trusted five, but who are the another trusted five? And can I make sure that they look and, and um, you know, and, and, and sound and have experiences that are different from mine? So that's just getting you in touch with, you know, it's, it's easy to be more biased when you surround yourself with people who look and act just like you. So let's move on for a moment because I want to make sure we can get to the breakout rooms as well. <clears throat> Should I, well, she doesn't yeah. want it. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So, and this is step three. Um, so getting educated, number one. Number two, trying to get in touch with your bias and being aware of that. And then number three, examining your privilege. And I think this is probably where I have um, focused the most and grown the most over the last three or four months because I didn't really understand what privilege was. You know, as I said, you know, when I talked to my black executive friends and, and peers, my assumption was because I was a woman, I understood um, what they had gone through as well. And it was through those conversations that I got clearer and clearer that my experience was incredibly different from what their experience because I was born into the world white. So if you, um, if we talk, think about how can we get in touch with our privilege and how can we use our privilege, this is where I'm placing the biggest focus right now. Um, you know, this consideration, uh, and, I've, and I've talked to, you know, my family about this. What does it look like for us to use our privilege to help someone else? Do we end up losing anything? And, you know, frankly, I, I know a lot of really well-intentioned white men who feel like they might lose their jobs if they open up uh, and support, uh, you know, other underrepresentation. There's a lot of fear there. So keeping the majority in power, whether it's work or whether it's politics, um, that is a real thing. And, and so that consideration of how we as white people or I as a white person have benefited um, is something I had never really thought about or talked about before. Um, the second is around reflection. Um, how privilege has helped me be where I am. Um, I had the opportunity to go to college. I have a broad network now that I leverage and that my network looks a lot like me um, or people in higher powers who happen to be white. A lot of them happen to be men. Um, I have access to that network. Um, how has my privilege helped me and how and, and therefore, other people who don't have that, how has it hurt them? So reflecting on that. Um, and then mostly, where, what can I do about it? Where do we have the power or influence that could drive, maybe not even systemic change, what could drive any change? And I want to go back to the story of Bev and Eddie. Um, Bev is an exceptionally successful ex-executive from IBM. She's retired and she's now um, doing all kinds of consulting work and, and working as a subcontractor and affiliate for Linkage. She's, you know, I've never talked to her about her wealth, but I, my perception was always she's doing this because she wants to do it, not because she has to do it. Eddie and I had never ha had that conversation. Um, and uh, Eddie presents himself exceptionally well. He's always in a suit and tie. He, has had a, he went to a fantastic university. And my assumption was, you know, Eddie's all fine. Um, it wasn't until I talked to Bev who said, you know, Jennifer, you, you know, we'd been doing all kinds of webinars and everyone was speaking for free in the middle of COVID. We were just offering support for leaders and there was no money exchanging hands. And she said, Jennifer, you can't ask. She didn't say you can't. She said, I would recommend you offer to pay Eddie for his time um, because we black people, you know, don't want to be in the service of educating white people 
you know, we, you know, there's value being exchanged. And so I, I turned to, I said, well, Bev, I'm going to pay you as well. It wasn't a lot. We said, you know, she said, give a thousand dollars to a charity, but offer to pay Eddie. So I, you know, I offered to pay Eddie. He was not only incredibly grateful, but through the conversation, I realized that he was looking for a new job and he was looking to figure out how I could help him in networking. Um, and then the very next week, the Wall Street Journal um, had attended our webinar because we, you know, the, like the Zoom kind of broke with, with, there were so many people trying to get into the webinar and he got wind of it and said, why do you think this race and allyship thing is going to be different? So I started talking to the journalist and I said, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't highlight me alone. Like I'm bringing Eddie into the conversation. And so Eddie's face, um, he became the main feature in the Wall Street Journal. And he came to me later and said, you doing that has opened up my business. I, I have now more and more business requests because of that Wall Street Journal. And it was a simple invitation to join me on an interview. I, it really changed the way I thought about what could I do to open the door for more black people intentionally. Um, so now Eddie and I, we're, we're talking about him potentially coming to work for Linkage. If that's an opportunity, I want to offer him that as well. Um, none of those things would have occurred to me independently had we not done that webinar together as an example. So where do I have power or influence just because of my role, just because of my position and authority, just because potentially I'm white and I have access to a, a, a different network than he does. Um, and then lastly is this curiosity. Um, it actually wasn't easy for me to have the conversation with Bev or with Eddie as we were preparing for our webinar. And they were uncomfortable too. And I'll give you an example. Um, I didn't know how to refer. You know, I said, do you, do you prefer that I talk about you as African American? Should I say black? I, I'm, I'm not sure how to talk about this. And they turned around and said, well, we don't know how to talk about you either. Should we say Caucasian or should we say white? And it was just funny, you know, because like engaging in these conversations, it, it was kind of, it was, it kind of made us laugh, but it also helped me understand that you know, those are pretty simple concepts, but what about the harder concepts as we start telling stories of our upbringing, which they did. And I got to know them more and more and appreciate the privilege that I don't think I realized that I had. So when we say examine your privilege, those are just a couple examples. Um, all right, so let's go to, I think the, the next page is gonna be the courageous conversations. And I, we started, like, as we examine privilege, we enter into courageous conversations. That was that curiosity that I just talked about and um, replacing assumptions and judgment. Again, my assumption about Bev, my assumption about Eddie, because he went to a good school, because he was always dressed up in a suit and tie, his business must be doing really, really well. Like those were just unconscious assumptions I was making. It took the authentic curiosity and the hard conversations to get to a different place. Um, it actually requires a lot more listening. When I listen to my white friends, because our perspectives are so similar, you almost don't need to, you know, it's a shorthand. You, we under, you know, even, you know, like Amy and Lisa and I can get together and it's just very easy. As I have to listen to other people's experiences and realize my discomfort um, and my different perspective and upbringing because I'm unaware, that's a lot harder. Asking hard questions and maybe like Eddie just said, look, I'll tell you this story, Jennifer, but I'm not telling the story on the webinar. I'm not ready to tell it. It's too uncomfortable. And he told me a couple stories that related to the police and his upbringing that took me to my knees and, you know, bursting into tears. And he said, I'm just, I'm not ready to tell those stories, but thank you for asking. Okay. Um, and then finding common interest and connection. So uh, one of the things I've done most recently, and I'm actually, it's, it's another risk. It's, I'm gonna un, we're gonna unveil it on October 14th in a leadership conference that's free. I told Lisa we should tell everybody about it after this call. Um, I have reached out to this incredible woman from Africa who has this entire new story and new um, picture of what inclusion needs to look like in the future. And so I went to her and said, I think we can work, I think we could figure out a way to work together and we're going to test our collaboration on this webinar that maybe 30,000 leaders are going to join. That's the, that's the expectation right now. Um, and so in this, in this case, it's a business connection. We're finding her work and our work and how it intersects and can we create something special together. 
But had all this not happened three or four months ago, I wouldn't even know about her. So I find myself, it's almost like a reinforcing loop now as I put myself out there, um, more and more people who look a lot different than me are coming into my life. And I'm, you know, I'm learning more than they are is my, is my assumption. Okay, so let's do this. Let's practice this. If you go to the next page. So this will be an example. Um, again, it's uh, as, as I look, we do, we do have different experiences. There's some, some diversity on this group, but it, there's not a lot of diversity of race, but I think it would be, a, it's a great conversation. Let's practice your point of view on kneeling or turning your back um, during the national anthem in, pro in protest of racial injustice. So listen to other points of view, ask questions, um, create curiosity, and let's do it for, what time is it? 11.43. You know, let's do it for seven or eight minutes. Uh, Bill's going to put us in a breakout room, and then when we come back, we'll we'll debrief the exercise. Okay, Jen. I just um, and we have not done a lot of breakout rooms, so I'm going to be. Um, uh, let me just explain for folks that may have not done it. So I'm going to. Um, what should happen is you'll be automatically placed in break, breakout rooms, um, and then Jen, I'm assuming you you want us just to have a conversation within those rooms, right? Well, so, yeah, yeah, so what I want you to do is, and it'll be interesting, maybe everybody feels the same way, it'll be a short conversation, but actually yeah. advocate your point of view and why, and everybody else, it's listening with curiosity and um, just practicing listen to, listening to other people's points of view. Okay, and so folks, you may, you'll get a message that you're being placed in breakout rooms. At some point, I will call you all back, uh, and, and God willing, we'll be back together in uh, seven or eight minutes. All right, here goes. <laughs> And it may ask you to accept the breakout room. So click accept if it asks. I'm going to put okay. us in, in groups of five. Does that sound about right? That's yeah. perfect. Okay. Thank you, Amy, for putting the question in the chat. Okay, so I can see folks joining. Annalise, I see you haven't joined the room. You should have an invitation to join. Evelyn and Anne as well. You can come off mute and just let me know if you're having trouble. Ann, you with me?
Hi, Ann. You're on mute. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, yes. Did you get into a room, Ann, or no? No, and I um, I just re-logged into Zoom because I couldn't get out of that screen that said joining room mm. three and then the little icon swirly thing, you know. Sorry. Funny. That's okay. It might be the Most icon. folks made it in. I, don't, I, I saw the rooms were populated. Well, I'll just wait then until we get back to the main room. How is it up there in Vermont today? Oh, it's beautiful. I'll bet. Welcome back, Jen. It looks like it worked. I think everybody's back. Did, give me a thumbs up. Did everybody get into a room? <laughs> Bill, you're amazing. <laughs> well, you're our, our first successful breakout room session. So, Jen, thank you for inaugurating that for St. John's. Perfect. Um, did anybody have an experience where in their breakout room there was a, uh, like a wildly different perspective? Or did everybody feel the same way? Lisa? So I would say not wildly different perspective, but I will say some interesting perspectives. Um, I think most of us or all of us agreed in that we support the right to take a knee. Um, but some of us were concerned about whether the reason for taking a knee is adequately understood by the audience in any different, any different um, scenario. And then one of us raised the very important point that I'm embarrassed to say I did not consider, which is um, members of our military who are out doing, you know, what they're doing for us are taught to um, honor the flag and die for the flag. And they take any disrespect of the flag or can take any disrespect for the flag extremely personally and painfully. And that was something that I have to say I had not considered. Um, and is a very, I think, important point, especially combined with the other point of, is it always clear why the knee is being taken? Yeah. I, I mean, that's a, that's a huge point because the way that it was portrayed, at least initially, was these people are anti-American, they're anti-military, they're anti the flag itself. And, and really the cause was so much deeper than that. Yeah. Uh, and I think you're right. I don't think it was clearly understood. Um, I didn't understand it at the beginning. And we were in our group, we talked about how it took Colin um, Kasternak, is that his name? It, it took him to lose everything. I mean, he, he lost his job. He was completely an outcast from the NFL. And how many years now has passed? So Nike stepped up um, and then more and more, then the black community was really started to support it and, and try and explain why they were doing it. And if you were listening, was easy to become to be, to understand it, but I don't know if most people were listening. And then finally, Roger Goodell saying, "I don't know." As soon as I change my clothes, I'm free. Well, um, I think it's interesting when you talk about you know honoring the flag or or disrespecting the flag. That yes, our troops are there, and we're so grateful for all that they do and they are fighting for freedom. So when I think of freedom, I think of one of the most important values that we have in this country is the ability to express ourselves and however that may be. So, um, you know, when you talk about what's patriotic, unpatriotic, there's, there's a lot of misinterpretation there because I feel like they're fighting for our freedom and our freedom is, you know, being able to, to express that. Your dad was in my, my dad was in the service. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, uh, I think it's just um, something that yes, people need to think more deeply about. So regardless of, of how you feel about that issue and they're, you know, even on the phone, there might be different perspectives on the issue. I think that the point of all of that was to um, going back to our framework, um, getting educated as you engage in these tough conversations, whether it's about race or about allyship or about inclusion, um, you know, how are you, can, can you become really clear about what bias is coming up? And, and oftentimes when you feel uncomfortable, there's something happening there. So get in touch with your biases, examine how privilege might be 
hurting me in this situation because I want things to stay the same or how I could use my privilege to help. Um, having courageous conversations. I think it's easier to have conversations with people who, you know, who, who, who look and feel and act a lot like you. It's harder to have courageous conversations with people that are very different, whether it's politically or on any social justice issues. Um, and then finally, practicing compassion with, with yourself and with others. I wanted to do one last exercise, Rick, if, uh, not Rick, Bill, if you can, sorry, Rick is my favorite man that I work with, Bill, so that was a term. No worries. If you, if you can go to um, the slide on page Oh, sorry, 14. okay. Let me share the screen. Yeah. I want to leave you with something actionable as we as we end our time together. And this is this was meant to hopefully be at you know, hopefully you're taking something away that was was new or something you hadn't considered before. Um, so one of the things I, I try and do when I set goals every day is I incorporate a question around, um, have I created um, in a, a safe environment where people can have courageous conversations, where people can explore their biases? Um, and I have to say, I, one of my direct reports said to me the other day, she's a white woman, and she said, like, Jennifer, when you said X in this way, um, it made me feel that you didn't value my contribution. And um, I wasn't happy to hear that, but I was happy that the environment was safe enough that she felt she could tell me that I was being, she felt excluded from that executive team meeting as an example. Um, did I effectively spotlight uniqueness and value that others made today and preferably others that don't look like you? And this is the whole concept of micro affirmations. Can we look and hold up like when I tell the Wall Street Journal reporter, you don't want to talk, you know, I'm happy to talk to you, but I'm not going to talk to you without Eddie. Here's what Eddie brings. Um, so can you highlight specific value and uniqueness of others? Did I listen to someone's point of view that was different from that of my own today? And I can go full days only engaging with people that look and sound a lot like me and it's a lot more comfortable, but intentionally trying to educate or learn or listen to something different. Did I step in and call out where I saw someone being diminished? Um, I don't know if we have time for this story, but I, um, a week or, well, I'll tell you anyway. A week or two ago, I was on a, a CEO forum uh, where it was just like this. There were 60 of us in a Zoom and we went to a Zoom breakout and I found myself in a Zoom breakout with six others. There were four male CEOs, um, one Latin, a couple white, and then there were two white women CEOs and a facilitator who was also a man. And he said, look, we need, um, we're talking about the future of you know, the biggest strategic challenges in your businesses for 2021. We need to capture the conversation and someone needs to report out. And the Latin CEO, very successful CEO of a family office in Latin America started to talk and I immediately my biases started to come up and I knew it was coming. And he said, I nominate Jennifer to take the notes. And, um, and I said, no, I'm actually not comfortable with that. I'm new to this group. I have never been here before. I, I would rather not do that, but why can't you take the notes? And he said, oh, I'm just very bad at taking notes. So then he turned to the other woman and said, um, okay, then Kelly, can you take the notes? And Kelly said, yes, she would. And, you know, I would call that a, a, a microaggression. He probably wasn't aware of it, but had I been had I felt more safe and more bold, I would have said, you know, I can't remember his name, Carlos, um, did you realize that you just asked both women to take the notes and, and feedback? Did you do that intentionally? I, I would have called it out because it would have been helpful for all the other male CEOs on the phone, but I didn't. Um, and I thought about that a lot in the last two weeks. Could I have done that in a way that wouldn't diminish him, but it, it would have made me feel a lot better. <laughs> so that kind of begs the question, what is the one thing I need to to do to be more intentional about being an ally tomorrow. And that's the exercise I want to end on. If you go to the next page, Bill, I'd like, you don't have to share it if you don't want to, you can put it in the chat. Um, but what's the one commitment, the tiny commitment that you want to make this week? Um, if something happens, then you'll do something else. Or what do, what do you commit to, to becoming a better ally, using your privilege to help this significant issue of racism in our country. 
and we'll end on that. We have, oh, it's perfect, 12 o'clock. I'd love for you to reflect on that for a few seconds. And if you feel comfortable, please go ahead and, and, and chat. I'm gonna chat myself. Thank you, Jen. I, I just want to offer a comment as well while we're, while we're reflecting. Thank you for your time today. Um, we usually have dozens of questions. I'm sure we do have dozens of questions. And I just want to offer you all that next week we're going to be regathering, same time, same place, uh, where, where we'll be exploring this topic. So I, I encourage everybody to think about it over the course of the week. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. So I'm going to chat my commitment to everyone. And then uh, we'll, we'll close with, you know, either hang up or chat your own commitment. But thank you so much for your time. It's a privilege to be with you all. Thank you. All right, with that, I'm going to hang up the, uh, they're here to clean my room. They're kicking me out of my hotel room. <laughs> I gotta go. Thank you so Thank much, you, Jennifer, for joining us. We really appreciate these fantastic insights. Have a good trip back. Safe travels. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Right, Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, Bill, you want to take us off the uh, share screen? Okay. So I hope everybody found that interesting. There's a lot of content there. Um, and we will uh, put a link to Jen's deck in the next Crossroads article if you're interested in looking at that or following up on anything. And then as Bill said, um, you know, we'll continue this conversation next week. Sari will lead the, the discussion as he did last week. Um, and so, you know, bring all of your thoughts and ideas and, and we can absolutely keep continuing here um, with some, some of the stuff that's coming up in the chat, but I just wanted to, uh, to give that plug for next week. Oh, and someone just said about the recording, we will also put a link to the recording in the in Crossroads so that you can see it. And, um, and Candy, I can, um, I can email that to you as well. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Does that Super. make sense?